Castro lives in, how it pulses with his changing moods. Look at the spottery claw that reaches down the hallway to Caligari's office. The hero's afraid of Caligari, and the hallway writhes and clutches with his fear, like a Walt Disney forest. Or look at the explosion of decorative motifs in the office itself, surrounding Caligari like a force field of manic authority. Or less inhibiting, the hinges elaborated into a, a gigantic butterfly's wing on the door that shuts Caligari into solitary confinement. A final image of vindication before delusion gives way to reality. But the hero's delusion Whatever its manic significance is more than a fantasy world, it's also the real world in a process of disintegration. Real objects continue to exist, and by their compulsive recurrence, become as disturbing as the film's expressionist distortion. Take books, for example, with their Faustian connotations of power. Everyone in the film is absorbed by books. Alan, the hero's friend, Francis, the hero himself, the town clerk, Jane, above all, Caligari, barricaded behind a mountain of books, who gains his power from a book, who even keeps a book on an implausible shelf in Cesare's caravan, who in his crazed hallucination transforms the universe into a sort of book with Caligari scrawled across the sky. Francis is able to expose Caligari only because he gains control of Caligari's books. And Venus Cutting makes it evident he thereby gains control of Caligari's mind. For mind control is the central theme of Caligari, which brings us back to Janowitz and Mayer, who, objecting furiously to the frame device, insisted their parable of corrupt authority was now reduced to gibberish was nothing but the ravings of a madman. But they were wrong, weren't they? First, because truth can come from the mouths of lunatics as well as babes. And the point of the hero's story, that in war, young men can be mesmerized into committing murder at the behest of authority, if this is in fact his point, is not necessarily invalidated by his insanity. And second, because even if we dismiss his story as nothing but a nightmare, we still must take it as seriously as a psychiatrist takes a dream. Not as literal truth, perhaps, but as figurative truth. And once we accept that premise, nothing is constant but the hero's psychosis. Everything is filtered through his deranged imagination. And the only fact is the framing sequence in the asylum. Or so we assume. After all, what do we really know about the story Francis tells? There's no way to prove either murder ever happened, or even that his victims actually existed. All we can tell from the framing sequence is that Cesare, who dies in the hero's story, is alive, if not exactly well. That Jane is a catatonic inmate in the same asylum, and that Caligari is the hero's doctor. Frankly, the hero's story looks like a fabrication constructed out of bits and pieces of the manic world around him. But remember, for the expressionist artist, as for the Freudian psychiatrist, it isn't facts, but feelings that matter. The trick is for us to analyze the tales of the hero's story, not as facts, but as symptoms. So that, in effect, we become Caligari. We act as the psychiatrist. So, who is this fellow, Alan? Well, he's a sort of alter ego for the hero. Literally, his better half, impulsive and generous. And Caligari? I guess you'd call him the superego, the father, the doctor, the priest. It's hard to say, since Francis is so ambivalent. One minute, Caligari's mincing and obsequious, the next minute, furious and tyrannical. I'd say the patient hated his father, or at least his psychiatrist. And Cesare, the Noctivandula? Ah, Cesare. Cesare's the id, the sleeping self, those unconscious urges the ego tries to keep boxed up, but which break loose despite its vigilance. There's something frightful in our midst, says Francis. 
Something that rises from its box at night to assault helpless victims in their bed. Well, you get the drift. But hang on. Before you say you're not a Freudian, you don't have to accept a system as fact in order to use it as art. So Caligari is to Freud as Star Wars is to Einstein. That doesn't make psychoanalysis irrelevant. If anything, so long as you don't take it too seriously, it makes it necessary. And my own diagnosis is this. Somebody around here is suffering from acute sexual psychosis, and it could be you. But let's take another look at Francis. The way I figure it, whether his guilt derives from actual crimes, like the one Janovitz saw that inspired the script, or paranoid delusion, Francis himself is the murderer. It's he alone who had a motive, who knew Alan's name and his address. Of course, he says it was Cesare, but even within his version of events, there's a trail of incriminating clues. Look at the sequence of Alan's murder, for example. All we see is a shadow on the wall, or rather, a shadow is all Francis lets us see, leaving an ambiguity, a faint suspicion it might belong to someone other than Cesare, even perhaps to Francis himself. Now look at his reaction to news of Alan's death. Is it grief and shock he tries to hide, or guilt and cunning? And when he rushes to Alan's room, why does his shadow loom above the bed like a visual echo of the murder? And look at his face as he turns away. Is it grief that causes his shifty-eyed expression or his calculated suggestion that this must be the work of Cesare? Next, he runs to the police, his right arm raised in a curious gesture, sliding along the wall. It's the gesture we'll see again as Cesare makes his way to Jane's bedroom, another hint that Francis and Cesare are the same. Then there's the dazed but detailed reenactment of the crime, almost as if he himself were sleepwalking. Francis compulsively reiterates the murder. And left alone with one of the policemen, he repeats the stabbing gesture. And again, more feebly, as he tries to persuade Jane's father of Cesare's guilt. Now, when Francis shows us how he alone takes his hat off, he's telling us in effect that he's a gentleman, and he makes the point more than once. But Caligari, he insinuates, is not a gentleman at all. Look at his sleazily erotic titillation as he lures Jane to his tent, exposing a dormant but soon awakened Cesare to her fascinated but uh, fearful gaze. The whole scenes of visual double entendre taking place, remember, in the mind of Francis. And later, when Francis insists Cesare has never left his box, Jane, recovering from her swoon, stares at Francis with stunned incomprehension and utters a single word, Cesare. The ambiguity is provocative, for Francis is Cesare. It is he and no one else from whom the violence of his story emanates, as a shot of Francis at the center of a wheel of shadows in the asylum yard suggests, a spot where no one else is permitted to stand, the bullseye at the heart of his delusion. So, it's all wrapped up, except for one small problem. Look at another shot of Francis in the asylum yard. It's from the end of the film, the framing sequence, the part that's supposed to represent reality. But the distortion I've attributed to the hero's delusion is still there. Which means, what? That Francis is sane and the rest of us mad in a mad conspiracy? Or simply and more plausibly, that the boundary between reason and madness is not so clear as we pretend? Okay, what we've reached in our discussion is not so much an impasse as a paradox but why do we find it so disturbing? Maybe because the basic fear of Caligari is of going mad oneself. Remember the poster? Du musst Caligari werden. Of course, there are those who see the film as political allegory, 
And it's true the Nazi party was being organized as the movie was shot. And it's also true, I guess, that Caligari is a sort of Hitler. Certainly the fascists were exactly what Janowitz and Mayer hated most. But I think we have to say the film's as much an allegory of the crazy left as of the fascist right, and maybe even more of those who are caught in the middle, like Alan and Jane, somewhere between the asylum and the fair. And in 1919, the choice wasn't nearly so easy as it looks from here. There were revolutions from the left and coup d'etat from the right and inflation and influenza and a general strike. And in the eye of the storm was expressionist art, not just a symptom of social and psychological unrest, but a modernist delight in disorder itself, a challenge quickly answered by the rectilinear style of national socialism. Caligari, the kind of analysis that's most revealing is less concerned with history than technique. Of course, most critics consider it a very theatrical movie that would work just as well on the stage. I think they're wrong, and part of my evidence is a sequence near the beginning of the film. Now remember, one of the things implicit in the story Francis tells is that Caligari and Cesare are bound to each other in a master-slave relationship each a sort of mirror image of the other, like it and superego. Vina conveys this paradox by linking images together, irising out on Caligari's back as the town clerk humiliates him, and irising in on a monkey at the fair, chained to an organ grinder and forced to perform. Now, any time two pictures are put next to each other in a film, there's a potential metaphor at work, a way of saying, look, this is like that, isn't it? What this edit implies, at least initially, is that Caligari, bound to his obsession, resembles the monkey bound to his organ grinder. But on second thought, isn't Caligari more like the organ grinder and Cesare more like the monkey? Well, Caligari himself is unaware of any connection with the monkey. After all, the ironies of this story are put there by Francis. What amuses Caligari is the appearance of a dwarf, for he does see an analogy between the dwarf and the monkey, to which the dwarf seems smugly oblivious. In the shot that follows, we see the same succession of people as before, as if to prepare us for the reappearance of the dwarf, who enters from the left, carrying a poster with grotesquely expressionistic figures on it. Once again, Francis is setting us up for an ironic analogy. Another cut, and Caligari emerges from his tent, ready to unroll a poster of his own, which turns out to be an expressionistic portrait of Cesare. Obviously, we're now being told Caligari is like the dwarf, which is to say, like the monkey, which is to say, assuming the monkey is the bestial unconscious, like Cesare himself. When we return to the fair, we iris in on the monkey as we did before, and Francis and Alan enter, their steps exactly choreographed to match those of Caligari when he arrives. But Francis and Alan ignore the monkey, which is quickly surrounded by a group of giggling girls, as titillated as Jane will be by Cesare in his box. Now we cut to a gawking crowd as Caligari rings his bell and makes his pitch. And the irony is clear. He's like the organ grinder too a showman with his monkey in a box. Well, maybe, says the skeptic, but what does it prove? Well, first of all, that Francis may be crazy, but he's not a dummy. What he's managed to suggest with his visual wit is the whole paradox of Caligari, part monkey, part dwarf, part organ grinder, animal, freak, and mountebank. And what he's managed to prove, I think, is that even with its technical crudities, Caligari's a movie, not just a play on film, and a clever movie at that, that still has secrets to yield. But it isn't Francis who gets the final word. It's Caligari, the benign psychiatrist now, who examines his patient and says, at last I recognize his mania. 
but I think I know how to cure him now. And yet, what's the cure to Caligari? Restoration of the hero's sanity or an exchange of violent delusions for the passive twilight of Cesare? Well, when the cabinet of Dr. Caligari opened in New York, audiences were spared this ambiguity. For, as the psychiatrist said, I think I know how to cure him now. An actor walked on stage and assured the audience, And he did! Francis Pernay is today a prosperous jeweler in Aidenwald, happily married with a couple of healthy, normal children. And the strangest thing about his recovery is the lapse of memory that accompanies it. He is like a man awakened from a bad dream, unable to remember any detail of its horror. The name Dr. Caligari today means no more to him than Smith or Jones. He has completely forgotten his hallucination. Well, if in the decades that followed, Germany was to lapse into a mass delirium like that of Francis, here was evident America would look the other way, dismissing it as a bad dream from which we could all awaken. But even today, the spirit of Caligari refuses to die. For who is this but Caligari? Long in the tooth, but Caligari still. Or this, but Caligari on the prowl. And who can fail to catch the joke when Professor Roth, on his way to the Blue Angel Cafe, is suddenly Caligari, mincing through the crazy streets of Holstenval once more. Du musst Caligari werden. When Hitler came to power, Konrad Weiss, who played Cesare, exiled himself from Germany. He was Colonel Strasser in Casablanca. But Werner Krauss, who played Caligari, remained in his cabinet, starring in propaganda movies for the Nazis. How's that for the coming Caligari? Until next time, I'm Benjamin Dunlap, and this is Cinematic Eye. Trache. I spend a lot of time on the ice with the New York Islanders, and I've seen a lot of goals over the years. Worldwide yeah. dollar money market fund. Since that day, Worldwide has delivered.